Hello YouTube, and welcome to the ultimate cardio slash calves exercises tier list. If you're new to this series, I've already covered every other muscle group and videos you can find in the description. So if there is an exercise you're wondering about, please refer to these, you have a lot to catch up on. Today, we are going to end this series with the two remaining things that I haven't talked about yet, namely cardio and calves. And I've decided to put the two together simply because there's enough overlap between the two in terms of exercises that I think it's a good idea to present them in the same video so that I can actually separate things that are good for cardio, so the ability to develop the lung and the heart, and things that will be good strictly for developing the muscles of the lower leg. We're going to start with the cardio tier list, and then we'll move on to the calves tier list. So in today's episode, you are going to get a double tier list. So it'll be a little bit long. And for the sake of precision, I must say that when I talk about cardio, I mean cardio in relation to bodybuilding. So I'm not going to be judging these exercises based on how good they would make you at a sport, right? If there's a cardio exercise that makes you a better basketball player, that's very well, but it really doesn't come into account here. I don't really care about that. What I care about is all the things I'm going to be talking about today, good in terms of conditioning for bodybuilding. So how many calories they burn, how fatiguing they're going to be, how time consuming they be, and also how much they impact your tendons will come into account because all of these things are going to have an impact on your ability to train for hypertrophy and aesthetics. As always in this series, if you're familiar with tier lists, you already know that I'm going to be ranking exercises from D, so the lowest tier, to S. Unfortunately, today I don't have any funny names for the tiers because I do two tier lists at once and also because I didn't really have any ideas come up to mind. So we'll stick to the simple letters. And naturally, the more useless at conditioning for bodybuilding a cardio exercise is, the lower it is going to be. So the ones that are going to end up in the A and S tier, you already know, are going to be absolutely amazing at turning you into a beast namely at making you fit. We use that name all the time and that term in the fitness community. It's actually in the name of our community, but do we really know what it means? What does it even mean to be fit? If I have big biceps, does it make me fit? If I have a six pack, does it make me fit? Some would say yes. For today's video, we're going to say no. All of these things make you big, they make you jacked, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're fit and a lot of bodybuilders struggle with that. Just because you have a nice core, just because you have veins does not mean that you're fit. It doesn't mean that you're in a good shape. You might be in a good staged shape, but in terms of your ability to run, in terms of your ability to recover, in terms of your ability to be healthy, that means nothing. So when it comes to things like cardiovascular and pulmonary health and endurance, we are going to treat them as completely different beings than hypertrophy. The two things are going to be separate. It's important to keep that in mind because this means that this tier list, at least the cardio section, is going to be special. Today, we're going to talk about exercises that will allow you to stay in the muscle game for a long time because they're going to develop muscles and abilities that are often underdeveloped in bodybuilders, namely the fitness of the heart and the ability of the lungs to actually pump a lot of oxygen into the body. And unlike what you might think, these things might be as important as your bicep or as your chest training for bodybuilders because if they're on point, not only do they not kill your gains like some people think, it actually boosts your gains because having a strong heart and strong lungs gives you better work capacity so you can actually get more volume in. It also improves the quality of your pumps and it boosts your recovery so you can train more frequently with more intensity. So if you are a cardio skipper, listen to what I have to say today because I have almost 40 options to pick from that I'm going to present to you guys meaning that you're guaranteed to find at least one or several that you're going to enjoy. With this presentation out of the way, we can start with the tier list proper and we're going to begin with the simplest and most natural way of doing cardio, namely walking. We all walk everywhere and we tend to forget how important it actually is. 
the more you walk, the higher your fitness is in reality. And so if you're the type of person who has replaced walking with squats, for example, you might not realize that you're actually hurting your fitness and you're actually hurting your ability to live a long life. So I'm going to place walking in the B tier because it is very low impact. It's not going to retax your fatigue too much. My only issue with the practice is that it's very time intensive. If you want to walk 10,000, 20,000 steps in a day, you are going to have to take an amount of time that you're going to have to budget for that activity and not everyone is able to in this modern world. I still think that most everyone should make the time, but I understand that it's not the most efficient way to do cardio for the average person. Certain ways are better. Now, when it comes to things that you can do just with your body that humans have been doing for tens of thousands of years, we have running. In this case, jogging is also a variation. I'm going to put running in the C tier. And you might think that this is a bit weird. Running should be better than walking because it's more intense. Yes, but it also is more taxing. If you run all the time, you know that it can tax your lower back. It, it can tax your shins. It can tax your knees. All things that might interfere with your ability to train legs in the gym. Is it impossible to do the two? Not at all. I know people who do heavy deadlift, heavy squats, and who also run during the same week. But I think that when it comes to cardio practices for bodybuilders, these long sessions of running outside are going to eventually run into your ability to train for, uh, for muscle building and muscle size. And there are better options in my list. So I'm going to place that fairly low. That way you get an idea of which things I think are going to be placed very high because they tend to have qualities that running simply doesn't have. We have, in that same vein, long distance running. And for the same reason I placed running in the C tier, long distance running is going to be in the D tier because it's a, speci a specialization that takes you far away from hypertrophy training. You're going to have to, for example, reduce your muscle mass because muscle mass is extremely demanding in terms of oxygen. And so this is the reason why most long distance runners are fairly skinny because this is what, this is what allows them to perform. And you might find that if you fall for the long distance running, not necessarily trap, but practice, if you want to improve that, that one thing, you're going to have to make sacrifices on the side. So this is simply not a good option on top of that. It's extremely demanding in terms of time, in terms of energy. It is very difficult to run marathons on the side. Some athletes manage, but usually it comes at a price and it's a price that you are most likely not willing to pay. So if these approaches to cardio are not that great, how can we make them shorter, more intense, make them more taxing and intensive and also align them best with muscle building? Well, I think that sprinting does that beautifully well, which is why to me sprinting in terms of cardio options is a tier. It is quite excellent, extremely fast, you don't have to do it very often. If you sprint once to twice a week, that's already a lot. Whereas most people who jog, for example, who run, have to run at least three to four times a week to make it worth their time to improve and to actually get all of the benefits that come with it. The beauty of sprinting is that it's in the name. It's a sprint. So it's short, it's condensed, it's a burst of energy, which also tends to align with the type of training you want to do for bodybuilding. The only real issue I have with sprinting is that you have to really pay attention to recovery. It is actually very taxing, which is what we like, of course, but it could interfere with your ability, for example, to do a hip hinge. And it is actually something that could get you injured because arm strength contraction at such a high pace with such a high intensity effort can sometimes lead to strains and to tears. If you do things properly, if you warm up, if you do your weighted stretch exercises, it will not happen. But I just want to make that clear. This is why it's not going into S tier. So... If we have low tax, high recovery, walking that's in B tier, and then we have the very intense short burst of energy of the sprint that's in A tier, how, how can we take the two of them, combine them to make something perfect? Well, this is the next entry on the list, something that human beings have been doing for a very long time. And back then, they were not doing it for sports. They were doing it for survival. And that is fartlek. Fartlek is the practice of running with variations of pace and intensity. So you're going to jog, for example, for maybe a minute or two minutes, 
Then you'll have a very short sprint for 10 seconds and then you'll jog for another minute or two minutes to recuperate and then you'll do it again. If you look at the history of Native Americans, for example, they didn't call them that, but what is known as the Indian run is very similar. The Indian run was you would have a column of 10 runners and the one who would end up last on the column would have to sprint to overtake the first person, which means that you would sprint by intervals. And that is the best of both worlds. You get the intensity of the sprint. You also get the slow pace and the, the recuperation of these jogs or these walks. And I find personally, as someone who has practiced fart leg for a very long time, that this is something that everyone can do because it's very instinctive and it's very, very easy to adjust. That's why you always make sure you never do too much. So I'm going to place this in the S tier, despite the name being fairly ridiculous. You can call it the Indian run if you prefer. But when we talk about things that are ridiculous, but also very good, we have to talk about rebounding. Rebounding is the action of simply, well, rebounding on the trampoline. And it might sound silly at first, but most studies have proven that rebounding is just as intense as jogging, but without the impact on the tendons, because the kinetic energy of your own body weight is not handled by you, it's handled by the trampoline. It also has a ton of beneficial properties for the lymphatic system. It is excellent for recovery. So overall, this is something that I'm going to have to place in S tier because you can do it from home, 15 minutes a day. It's going to be very, very easy on your recovery and it's going to have a massive impact for the little investment that you put in it. So that's our second S tier. But not every single item in the gym or outside of the gym that facilitates cardio is good. And I think that the next entry on the list is a perfect example, the treadmill. Unfortunately, the treadmill is the worst because one, you're now stuck within a gym instead of enjoying the outdoors and nature, that's already a minus. And on top of that, the treadmill does the work for you. Many people don't realize that, but as you advance on the treadmill, you give energy to the treadmill, which itself gives energy to you. It's a close chain. And this is why so many people like to go to the gym to walk on the treadmill. But 10,000 steps on the treadmill is not 10,000 steps outside. It is much, much easier. And the amount of calories you burn from it, the amount of muscles you build is almost non-existent. So this is not something I think anyone who is serious about fitness should consider doing, I'm going to place it in the D tier. When it comes to things that people do in order to get their heart rate up, we then have the rope, jump rope. This one is also not that good to me because one, it requires a lot of coordination. All of the time you're going to spend as a beginner on the jump rope is being able to develop the end and eye coordination to not trip. And you know that if you've ever attempted that. If you get to the level where now this, not, this, this is not a problem anymore, you're going to also realize that jump rope is really not that tiring at all. You can do it for a very long time unless you go at a very high pace. It's something that is going to greatly develop your balance and your sense of rhythm. So for a boxer, for example, it's a good exercise. But for someone whose goal is just to develop the ability to actually lift more weight or recover faster, this is not something for you. It's simply not, it's simply not time efficient. Jumping jacks are a bit better because they remove the necessity for uh, balance and for coordination. So it's much easier to do them very fast and to get a quick workout in. On top of that, they require no equipment whatsoever. Your own body is enough. So I'm going to place the jumping jacks in the B tier. Burpees are in the same category. A burpee is a full body workout in a sense that is going to force you to move through space. And as you know, burpees are extremely difficult. There's not a single person on earth that can get away with doing burpees for 10 minutes and not being out of breath. They are designed to make you out of breath because the entirety of the muscles have to be involved. And on top of that, you jump and jumping and then catching yourself and lowering yourself down is going to require you to spend a lot of energy. So I'm going to place the burpees in the A tier. I do think that they are an excellent cardio option and they also will build a decent amount of muscle, but they're not the best of the best. When we're talking about a thing that will be directly available to most people who will step into a gym and which will procure a full body workout, I think you cannot beat the rower. It's going to make the big muscles of the back and the legs work with very little impact on the tendons of the knees and the shoulders. 
and overall is going to make you tired extremely quickly. So this is something that is very, very time efficient and also that is not going to hurt your recovery too much. To me, that is an S tier. Granted, of course, you do it properly. There are many ways to fuck up the rower, especially if you don't know how to pull with your back and if you don't know how to use your legs. But that has nothing to do with the machine and everything to do with humans being dumb in general. Now, outside of machines, there are also techniques or lifting strategies you can apply in the gym in your resistance training routine to bump your cardio up. AMRAPs being a good example. An AMRAP means as many reps as possible. You pick an exercise and you go very high. Now, most of the time, this also means that what will limit you on AMRAPs will very rarely be muscular endurance. It will most likely be cardiovascular endurance, which is why doing sets of 30 for squats is not that good for hypertrophy because you will get stopped by your heart and your lungs. But if you apply these AMRAPs, in the context of cardiovascular endurance, then they make a lot more sense. Because now, you will get tired super fast, nothing is more tiring than high rep squats, and on top of that, it is direct conditioning that is specific to your squat pattern. So you'll still gain muscle, and you'll become more endurance for when it's time to move heavy weight for lower reps. So I'm going to place the arm wraps in the C tier. It might seem a bit low, but the reason why I'm doing this is because if they give you that much benefits, you understand that there's also a price to pay. An AMRAP applied to a compound movement is going to be very, very taxing on the joints and not something you should do every single day or even multiple times a week. So you have to use it sparingly. The same goes for the next entry on the list, giant sets, supersets, whatever you want to call them, when you go from exercise to exercise with no rest in between. I use giant set here because the giant set has more than two exercises, so naturally it's going to be more tiring. Same as with the AMRAPs. If your giant set turns into a cardio circuit, you're doing giant sets improperly because it's going to damage your ability to put on mass. But if you do it properly with just enough exercises, it's going to get your heart rate up just enough that it'll be challenging throughout the workout without impairing your ability to push heavy weight. And in that context, to me, giant sets are B tier because it's a passive way to increase your cardio and there's almost no price to pay as opposed to an AMRAP. So if you manage to build up to a point where you can do giant sets for every single workout, which is what I'm doing personally, not only do you save a shit ton of time, but your base level of cardio will always be relatively high. It's something that I found out where I've been training with giant sets for four years now, and I recently started doing high intensity cardio again, and I was extremely surprised to see that I have a lot of cardiovascular endurance and stamina, even though I skipped cardio literally for four years, which is not something I recommend. I did it because I knew I could get away with it. I have a background in athletics where I did a shit ton of cardio, so I knew that my heart and lungs were doing well. But it was still surprising to see how well giant sets managed to preserve that stamina. And then we have high intensity interval training, which is also a method that I'm going to place in the A tier because the method in itself applied to whatever you want is super sound, which is also why Fartlek was in S tier. Fartlek is a type of high intensity interval training mixed with running and sprinting. You can do whatever you want with the practice and you can really be imaginative. You can do it when you swim, you can do it on a hike, you can do it picking a low impact resistance training exercise. All of it is going to work beautifully well because we have found out that spiking your heart rate and then having periods of lower intensity exercise seems to be extremely beneficial for human health, but also for body composition, fat loss, etc., etc. Now, I just spoke about swimming, so let's rank this one next. Swimming is a very popular form of cardiovascular exercise for a reason. It's because it's great. It has everything you want. It's very low impact because you're in the water, so you don't carry your own body weight. It's, it's easy on the joints. It is also extremely fun, much more fun than running, in my opinion. And unless you are a trained athlete, 30 minutes of swimming at a high pace will spend you. If you don't have time, you can do, as I said, high intensity training with swimming as well. Just do sprints and then after the sprints, swim at a slower pace. I guarantee you will not last 15 minutes. On top of that, it's also going to develop the muscle of the shoulders, of the back. It's going to help with your flexibility if you have poor shoulder mobility. So this is a no brainer. I'm putting it in the A tier. My only issue with swimming is that one, not everyone has access to a swimming pool. I recognize that. 
and two, it is still possible to get injured while swimming, while rare shoulder injuries do exist. So I cannot put it in S tier. Actually, there is a form of aquatic gymnastics and exercise that does land itself in S tier and is going to surprise all of you guys, but it's water aerobics, which in French we call aqua gym. Aqua gym is the thing that you see the old ladies do when you go to your community pool and you think, well, there is absolutely no way this is a beast exercise for cardio. What the fuck are you talking about? It isn't when the old ladies do it because they do very low intensity stuff so as not to have a heart attack in the pool and die. But if you, a grown man, a grown woman who is fit, does it, you can push the, in the intensity to a level where you will want to die in the water. I can show you exercises, aerobic exercises in the water that are much harder than deadlifts, much harder than squats, that will challenge your heart and your lungs at a level you've never experienced before. So I'm placing it in the S tier. On top of that, I have personally experienced rehabbing a knee injury in the pool using these methods and it works simply because the water is going to decrease the amount of stress on the tendons, but it increases the resistance on the body because the friction of the water on your body makes it harder to move. So now the muscles have to work twice as hard. It is literally a match made in heaven. That being said, I understand that some of you guys might not enjoy spending your afternoons in pools with old ladies. So if that's the case, you can give battle ropes a try. They are very badass looking and usually it's MMA fighters doing them. But the question I have is, do they look as cool as they are effective? And the answer sadly is no. Because oftentimes what will limit you on the battle rope is the endurance and stamina of your shoulders and not of the heart and lungs. So I'm going to place them in the C tier. They are still a valid option, but in my opinion, we can do better. And in the family of exercises that look harder than they actually are, we have the medicine ball slam. It is when someone picks up one of these big balls and they just slam it onto the ground or the wall. It's extremely obnoxious, it captures the attention of everyone in the gym, whether they like it or not. But in terms of cardio, it's also not the bee's knees. It's going to be very great if you want to train your ability to rotate, which a lot of athletes need. But if you're a bodybuilder, you are not an athlete, you are a midhead. And this option is not going to be the best for you. So unless you cannot deadlift heavy enough to drop the weight from waist high, which is guaranteed to catch the attention of everyone, I don't recommend doing that. I'm going to place it in the B tier. I think that when it comes to moving objects and actually using the body holistically, something like kettlebells is much more interesting. They allow for a greater range of patterns and usually you can really push the reps very high. It's not going to damage your body to recover too much for the other big lifts. And it's going to also build a decent amount of muscle. You have a lot of quote unquote kettlebell only athletes who showcase bodies that are shockingly aesthetic. So I'm going to place it in the A tier. The fact that the Soviets swore by kettlebell routines to develop stamina and conditioning also plays a role in it. There is something to be said about the implement, the versatility of it, the fact that it's very easy on the joints, all of that makes for a beautiful cardio exercise. Then there's also the fact that the kettlebell court, as I like to call it, is indeed a court and I don't want them to send mercenaries to my house to get me killed because I talk shit about kettlebells. So I hope I am in the clear with this placement. And the same goes for the sandbag. The sandbag is an implement that anyone can build themselves, unlike kettlebells that can become very expensive. You can literally make one yourself with a bag of rice that you fill up with rocks or with sand from your backyard. And they are also very versatile. You can do sandbag tosses, sandbag carries, whatever you can think of you can do with a sandbag and it's super fucking hard because not only are you moving your own body through space, now you're also moving something that weights the equivalent of five fat raccoons. And as we all know, moving fat raccoons is very, very tiring. So I'm going to place sandbag training in the S tier. Also for the same reason as kettlebells, there are a lot of people who swore by it and they will get very mad at you if you tell them that their exercise of choice is silly. It does look a bit silly, but we're not judging here whether or not it looks cool because if it were the case, again, something like the battle ropes would be much higher. 
at the end of the day, picking something moderately heavy and moving it for time is what people have been doing for time immemorial and it has always produced tremendous results, both in terms of physics and also in terms of cardiovascular ability. Now we're going to start talking about a family of exercises that I call the climbers because at some point or the other you are doing the action of climbing. Although that's not always true, the first one, for example, is only climbing in the name. It's the mountain climbers. And if I tell you that, most of you guys won't be able to know exactly what this is supposed to be. I'm not talking about going to Mount Kilimanjaro and actually climbing that shit. That would make for great cardio. It would also kill you. No, the mountain climber is when you get onto your hands and knees and you move your knees back and forth very fast. In a sense, it's an ab exercise. And as an ab exercise, it does a decent job. As a cardiovascular exercise, it also does a somewhat decent job. It's a bit in the same family as the battle ropes. So for that reason, I'm going to place it in the C tier. I think that this is an option for someone who wants to develop their ability to do more core work, to develop the endurance of their abs, and they also want to get their heart rate up. That is going to tire you very, very quickly. But since you're resting on your hands, oftentimes what will give up first is your chest and your shoulders. Then we have the vertical climber. So that one is actually not a lie. You're technically climbing, but not really because you're going nowhere. You know, it's these machines that just have you move your hands back and forth with your feet at the same time. So there we have a full body workout. And when you look at cardio exercises, something that forces the entirety of the muscles to act is going to be very taxing. But since there is no impact on the joints, because unlike running, for example, you're not slapping your foot repeatedly on the floor, on the ground, this is not going to have as much impact as you think. So I'm going to place this one into the B tier. My gym personally does not have one of these, but I think that when it comes to machines that allow you to elevate your cardio, this one is actually a good choice. But we can do better. And how can we do better? Well, simply by going back to the roots. What is this supposed to represent and to actually copy? It's supposed to copy the action of climbing. So why not just climb? Well, if you have a rope in your gym, you can just do that. Rope climbing is extremely taxing. It's taxing on the forearms, on the back of the musculature of the arms, on the core. It's a surprisingly good core workout because you have to stabilize yourself throughout the climb. And on top of that, because you move the body, not just through space, but up space, because you're literally climbing up the rope, you are going to find that this is indeed a beast of a workout. And I think that your ability to climb up a rope says a lot about your strength to weight ratio. Calisthenics have this ability to really humble people. If you are very strong on that pole dance, for example, but you really struggle to pull yourself up a rope, you might have weak links in key areas of your body, like your grip, or even like the actual strength of your back that might not actually be that great. So for that reason, because it humbles the shit out of people, I am placing rock climbing in A. There is an inherent risk of falling if you're clumsy or if you just go to failure, which you should not be doing. So in this case, you can just do the machine. Some gyms have rock climbing machines that are just a rope dangling from what looks like a lat pull down and you can just do it without really moving your body. Now, the issue with this is that it's, of course, much less taxing, so it's less time efficient, but you have to weigh that around with how much you want to preserve the bones of your pelvis if you end up falling from that rope. Now, the next option on the list is much, much safer because instead of being a rope, it is actually a ladder, and that is what is known as Jacob's Ladder. Likewise, you are very unlikely to have ever seen that in a gym for the simple reason that the machine costs $6,000 and who has the money for that? Especially since from what I know, these machines are very easy to break. But when you look at what they do, they allow you to literally climb up a ladder that puts you at an incline of sort, which is horribly taxing because you climb on your hands and knees. So the entire body has to work. And so for that, I'm going to place it in the A tier. If you ever run into one of these machines, give it a try. It might become the form of cardio that you enjoy doing the most because you won't have to spend much time on it. There is nothing worse than having to spend 20, 30, 40 minutes doing something just to get a slight elevation in heart rate. That is guaranteed to make you pant like a dog within the first five minutes of starting the exercise. 
And in the grand family of, of machines in the gym that have that power and that everyone hates and loves at the same time, we have the king of kings, we have the stair master. If you are the type of person who can spend an hour on the stair master, I'm here to tell you that you're training like an absolute pussy. If you actually use the machine properly with a high pace, you are not going to last more than 20 minutes on that thing. I can guarantee you that. And if you're especially a psycho, grab a backpack, put kettlebells or plates in it and do the, st the stair masters for time with that on your back. If you can do half your body weight for 10 minutes at a high pace, you are a cardio monster. So for that, I'm going to place the Stair Masters in the S tier also because pretty much every single gym has them for a reason. They are, in my opinion, the best cardio machine out there on top of being very easy on your knees, your lower back and your hips because unless you're the type of idiot who literally runs on the Stair Master, you're supposed to do one foot after the other so it's very easy to recruit the musculature of the legs and not the joints themselves. But if for some reason you don't have access to a gym or your gym doesn't have star masters, you have two choices. Either you threaten the life of the gym owner so that they buy one, which I don't recommend, or you just climb stairs in real life because yes, it is also possible. And if you have played sports at some point or the other, your coach took the entire team, usually on a rainy day, they always like to do it when it rains, and you then just spent a fucking afternoon climbing upstairs until you puked. Don't ask me why they love it so much, maybe because they're fans of the Rambo movies, but it's a bitch and it's a very good way to challenge your heart and your lungs. Now, my issue with climbing stairs straight up is that one, you can fall, and when you fall, it hurts like a bitch, I know what I'm talking about, and two, you have to come down the stairs, which doesn't make for a good exercise. So, unless you manage to work this into a high intensity interval training scheme, it's going to be detrimental. On top of that, most public stairs are not maintained well enough, so sometimes they're slippery for no re reason, which can be dangerous. You also have to deal with the fact that some people actually want to take the stairs not to train, so you also have to deal with these peasants. And for these reasons, I'm putting just climbing upstairs in the B tier. In my opinion, it is still much better than long distance running or jogging, but it comes neck to neck with the simple action of walking. Now for the next entry on this list, we're going to talk about a movement that, while natural, is also something that we never do in everyday life, and that is crawling. Unless you're a baby, of course, in which case, why are you watching this video? But if you're an adult, you have stopped crawling for decades and decades. And that's what makes it so good. Because if you actually get down to it, you'll realize that the action of crawling is horribly difficult. It challenges the entire body. It challenges the core, the hips, but it is also very, very taxing for your lungs. So I think that you should give it a try. This is the type of movement that if you bring it back into your daily routine, might improve the totality of your fitness and health. And for that reason, I'm going to place crawling in the S tier. Also because it takes no equipment and you can use it to scare your neighbors. Try crawling around their houses at 3 a.m. and tell me if they don't move houses in the next week. Now, for the next installment, we're going to talk about bikes. Things that you can have in your house that is supposedly going to be great for cardio. And we're going to begin with the worst item you can possibly purchase if your goal is to become more fit. That is steppers, steppers, les pédalos, these things that you put on the floor while you watch Netflix and you move your feet back and forth. These things do absolutely nothing, which is why they are so beloved by fat people, also called Americans. This is why I'm placing steppers in the D tier. They do jack shit. They have really no action or stimulus whatsoever. Sure, they're going to be low impact because you're not actually doing anything. Then we have an exercise bike. If you have parents that are still alive, that are between 40 and 60, you have at some point had an exercise bike in your house. It was most likely white, it was also most likely never used, and your parents used it to put on clothes because they bought it for health purposes and then they never used it ever again. And it's just going to end up in a landfill somewhere and that is where it deserves to be because I don't think it's a good piece of equipment for cardio. For the most part, it's low intensity. You have to spend hours on it for it to be relevant. The seats hurt your ass. Now you have ones with big ass TVs on them, which 
how much further are we going to dive into degeneracy? Like you can't even do cardio without being bombarded by bright colors. I'm placing this bullshit in the C tier. There are much better ways to use bike implements for cardiovascular reasons. Namely, the elliptical bike. I know that people like to make fun of this, but at least you're using the entire body and it's going to tire you out very quickly if you do it fast. My only qualm with this product being that all of them are garbage from China that don't feel good. They feel clanky, like they need oil, but they're not made of metal, so what the fuck? I'm placing it in the B tier because if you end up finding one that's high quality, you most likely enjoy it greatly for your cardio because the impact on the tendons and recovery is almost zero. But when we talk about bikes for cardio, I think that the Magnum Opus, the Mona Lisa of bikes, is the attack bike. It's the perfect mix between an exercise bike and an elliptical bike because you use the entire body, but it's also made in a way that is extremely, extremely challenging. In a sense, it's comparable to a war machine. So I'm placing it in the A tier. Also, attack bikes are so expensive that if you buy one, you have no excuse but to use it. Then we have biking. Shocking, I know, biking is actually better than all of these options. Just get a fucking normal bike and bike around. It's going to save you money on gas. It's going to prevent you from having to share public transportation with people who should not be allowed to be outside. It's fun. You're in nature. You breathe in the fresh air. And you also run the risk of being hit by a car because people don't know how to drive. But still, I think that biking in itself deserves to be in the S tier. If you bike up a hill, 10 minutes is all you need to get a great workout. It is also going to help you grow your calves, which since you never train them, is going to be more work than you get for the entirety of the time you spend in the gym anyways. So these were for the options that are more conventional. We're going to end with things that are not conventional, but I think are worth mentioning because some of you guys might be doing it for cardio purposes. Starting with skiing. So if you're the type of person who skis regularly, you are one, rich, and two, you also know how fun it is. And doing something fun for cardio is very important because if it's not fun, you're not going to stick to it. My issue with skiing per se, like the, the proper activity of skiing, is that the injury rate is way too fucking high and the types of injuries you get skiing are the worst of the worst because there are ligament tears in your knees. So for that reason alone, I'm going to place skiing in the D tier also because it's not accessible at all. It's super expensive and making cardio accessible is also very important. But in the family of snow sports that might be good for cardio, we must mention cross-country skiing, which is a much safer version of skiing because it's much, much slower. And on top of that, unlike skiing, where your heel is fixed to the ski, which is, by the way, the reason why the injury rate is so high, is because when you eat shit, you cannot negate the damage by lifting your heel, so the entire knee just fucking goes. In cross-country skiing, you lift up the foot every single time you step forward, which makes it a tremendous leg exercise. Anyone who's done it knows how tiring it is. When you look at it on TV and you think, oh, it must be so fun to just slide gracefully through the magical snowland. Nuh -uh. It's not fun at all. You sweat like a pig, you want to die, but it's a good exercise. So it goes into the B tier. But we can still do worse. We can still somehow manage to turn the magic that is snow into a torture device to transform humans into conditioning beasts. And that engine of torture is called the snowshoe. Snowshoeing is absolutely... It is, it is so hard that it's tough to believe that some people do it for fun. But I've known people who had massive legs, quads and hams, straight up from snowshoeing, not a single squat in their life. And that is simply because you have to fight against the snow. Even though technically the shoe allows you to not get into the snow too deep, you still have to fight against it for every single step. And for that reason, I'm going to place snowshoeing in a tier because anyone who's done it at a high pace know that it really fucking sucks, but it also builds tremendous stamina and tremendous endurance. My only issue being that it also tends to be very hard on the ligaments of the knees, so that is detrimental in my opinion. 
if you want instead to do something that is going to be much lower pace, much lower intensity for longer periods of time, but with great benefits, you can do hiking. Hiking to me is a tier, which might be a bit weird because if we compare it, isn't hiking just a form of walking? You are right, but it's walking in nature. And I think that being in nature, in the mountains in particular, when you walk has tremendous advantages. 10K steps in your city with like people who smoke cigarettes and pigeons and 10K steps in the mountains are entirely different beasts. In the mountain, you have uneven terrain. So your ankles, knees and lower back have to adapt. That is extremely, extremely tiring. It requires a lot of stamina and it also conditions the entirety of the lower body. It makes you quote unquote bulletproof. And you also get to enjoy the great scenery. And if you're lucky enough, you can also see Bigfoot. For that reason, I think that hiking is a tremendous opportunity for anyone to get dark cardio up because who doesn't like hiking? But we can make it even better by simply adding a backpack to the experience. And now suddenly we are rocking. Rocking is the action of going hiking or for a walk at a high pace with a backpack with weight in it. And that is the best form of walking in my opinion, which is why to me it goes into the S tier. Because the more weight you use, the less time you'll have to spend doing it to get the same amount of benefit. I also think that there is something to be said about carrying heavy weight on your back when it comes to your posture. Unlike what some people like to think, rocking has the ability to fix your posture. And if you're the type of person who lifts heavy, spending a lot of time, like 15 to 30 minutes with heavy weight on your back, but not so heavy that you cannot move, is going to greatly level up your psychology when it comes to training because it's going to get you used to heavy loads. And so when it'll be time to move these heavy loads, you will be much more comfortable. How many times have you unracked a heavy squat or picked up a heavy Romanian deadlift and thought, oh shit, I cannot do it. You can do it but the sensation of the weight on your body makes you freak out. Well, rocking is going to take care of that. And then for the final entry of this list, we have wood cutting, another thing that is quite exotic and done in nature, but I think that it is greatly underrated. So I'm going to put wood cutting in the A tier. It's a great exercise for the back, for the shoulder. It works on your mobility. It also works on your explosivity because if you ever cut wood, you know that you use the weight of the body that you transfer to the ax and then onto the wood to chop it in half. You don't only use your arms. And if you do it at a fast pace and you have a good technique, it is going to also be extremely, extremely challenging on top of being super fun. If you have watched any Rambo movies or these like these compilations of people training in nature, at some point or the other, someone is chopping wood because it is absolutely fucking cool. And as we all know, an exercise that looks cool gains points automatically. And that concludes the cardio tier list. So now it's time to move to the calf tier list. And just to make it clear, I separated them on purpose because you'll see that some exercises come back into this tier list, but they'll be placed at different spots because an exercise good for cardio isn't necessarily good for calves and vice versa. If anything, it's actually the opposite. If a movement taxes your cardio, it's going to be very hard to actually recruit the calves effectively, as you'll see in this tier list. And while I know that the calves are not the most popular muscles out there, and I'll be honest with you guys, I also don't care much about them. I would always prefer having big biceps and having big calves. It also must be said that the majority of people who think that it's impossible to grow big calves are full of shit. Just like with any other muscle, if you train your calves properly, they will grow. They're not 100% genetics like some people would like you to believe. But the reason why these people believe into that nonsense is because they don't know how to grow their calves. They don't know the proper methods to grow their calves and they don't know which exercises work and which exercises don't. So it's really an issue of consistency because they cannot stick to it and biomechanics. And in both cases, that can be fixed with proper exercise selection. So this is why I wanted to make this tier list for you guys so that you have no more excuses. I'm going to give you the best calf exercises and then you can just pick them, apply them, progressively overload and you will get results. There's no way around that. And to give you a good idea of the criteria I apply to calf exercises, to me, a good calf exercise is one that is easy to load because yes, you're supposed to load it easy to progressively overload on, so you're supposed to be able to actually track your strength progression on the exercise. 
allows for a good stretch because the stretch is what matters the most for calf growth and also doesn't require too much balance or cardiovascular endurance. We want something that isolates the calves and can destroy the calf muscle in priority, which also means that movements that allow for a slow tempo will also be prioritized because we don't want wear and tear on the Achilles tendon and the ankles. So let us get started with this tier list. And we're going to begin with bodyweight calf raises. So in the same spirit as the cardio tier list, where I started with walking to give you a broad idea of where everything was going to go based on my criteria, I'm going to put the bodyweight calf raises in the D tier. Because if you think you're going to grow big calves with only your body weight and a limited range of motion, you are in for a rude awakening because the action of a bodyweight calf raise is essentially what you do on a day-to-day -day basis when you walk. Your calves are already used to that movement. So if you don't give them an extra challenge, they are never going to grow. Meaning that exercises that follow will be naturally weighted or with extra range of motion, which leads us to the donkey calf raise. Now, to me, that is C tier. It's one of the worst variation of calf raises out there. One, because the position you're in really doesn't make it easy at all to load the movement. Unless you have a donkey calf raise machine, you're going to have to rig something with a belt. It's not going to be convenient at all. And on top of that, you're going to end up finding that it can be very uncomfortable on the lower back. If you have an exercise for calves that ends up being limited by the lower back, you know that there is a problem. So not something I would actually recommend. And on top of that, I've heard people say it, so I'm here to dispel that myth. The donkey calf raise doesn't target or doesn't stimulate any muscles that other calf raises don't already do. It does nothing special in terms of biomechanics. Then we have the seated calf raises. So the seated calf raises will put you in a position where your knees are going to be bent, which, as you might know, is going to recruit certain parts of the calves in particular and quote-unquote ignore others. In truth, the entirety of the calf is going to work. But the issue that you're going to find with that movement is that you're going to be very strong at it because you're put in a position where the calf doesn't have to do as much work. Now, it's made up for by the fact that the stretch is immense and you can really abuse the stretch by pushing on the weight at the end of the set. So you do a set of 15, then at the end of the set, as your calf is fully stretched, you push on the weight to add additional load so as to stretch the calf even more. That is a method that some people might call beyond failure training, and it's very effective. But... It also comes with a host of inconveniences. For example, I have found personally that seated calf raises can be a bit uncomfortable on the knee sometimes if the pad digs into the knee too much. So I'm only going to place it in the B tier. For my money, I've oftentimes found that standing calf raises tend to be much more effective for growing the calves. Now, recently, some studies have came out to actually prove that this seems to be the case where the majority of the musculature of the calf is activated when doing exercises standing and you only really lose activation when you're sitting. This is to be taken with a grain of salt and at the end of the day, I think you should do both. But this is also why I'm going to place the single leg calf raise in the A tier. When you do a single leg calf raise, not only is the calf put in a very disadvantageous position because now one has to handle the weight of the entire body, but on top of that, I find that you can really abuse the range of motion because your ankles are not stuck. You know, when you're doing your double leg stuff for calf development, it can oftentimes be that one calf is going to work harder than the other because for some reason you'll have a hip imbalance. And so one is going to be put in a position where it's much stronger. And that can be an issue. So if you want to correct that and you want to also work on the flexibility of the ankle, doing it one foot at a time might help. The only problem with this variation that I find is that it can be uncomfortable and it can also be something that is very hard to load. And this is why to me, the standing calf raise with the two at the same time is going to still be superior because ability to load is a given. You can do it with a machine. You can do it with a Smith machine. I recommend not doing it with a barbell for stability's sake. But at the end of the day, if you have weight that's pressing on top of you and you actually do your reps with a slow tempo, you're going to be golden. Now, I, of course, expect you to do it with an elevated foot 
so as to be able to actually drive the heel into the range of motion. Do not do it with your foot flat on the floor. That's sort of defeating the purpose. But if you do it properly with something to elevate the foot, again, with a slow tempo, you are going to see that the more weight you put on that exercise with high reps, the more hypertrophy you're going to see. This is the biggest anti-black pill calf exercise because if you stick to it and you get stronger, you will see results. So for that reason, I'm placing it in the S tier. Do not be the person who just does this shitty rebounding reps that does absolutely nothing, which is why the dumbbell calf hopes I'm placing in the D tier. These are essentially these like small jumps that you do by extending and pushing on the calves with dumbbells in your hands. One, you're not getting as much of a stretch because the range of motion is shit. The time annotation is shit because the tempo is garbage. You're literally just jumping in place. And on top of that, the challenge you get for the muscle is not even that great because you do it with dumbbells. So unless you're going to do it with like 200 pound dumbbells in each hand, which you will never be able to pick up, you will never actually be able to find a way to stimulate the calves more than they would be stimulated with you just walking around for an hour. And that kills the exercise because a good calf exercise is something that is going to put a lot more pressure on the muscle than what you do on a day-to-day -day basis which might point to plyometrics being a good idea because with plyometrics, you apply a ton of strength and a ton of energy in the movement because you're being propelled by the calves. So surely that should be much better. Well, unfortunately, that is not the case because most of the time with plyometrics, what actually allows the body to move through space and which offers the most power, where the power comes from is knee bend and it's hip hinge. So it's the mus musculature of the hips, it's the musculature of the quads. You can find a ton of people who are super explosive athletes who run super fast, who jump super high, who have garbage calves. I personally have gotten when I was younger to pretty impressive high jumps and I have gotten to a point where I was able to dunk a basketball and my calves were garbage because the plyometric that I applied to my training was not best aligned with the hypertrophy of the calf muscle. So for this reason, I'm going to put plyometrics also in the D tier. It could be in C tier, to be honest with you guys, but the amount of stress it puts on the body it simply disqualifies it as a calf exercise. And the same goes for running and the jump rope. Yes, these movements are going to make your calf burn, but if it were as easy as that, you could just do sets of 100 with an empty barbell for biceps and your biceps will be massive. The accumulation of lactic acid in the muscle does very little for the muscle to grow. If anything, it'll do the exact opposite because you will fatigue that muscle in that fashion so much that when it's time to actually use it for resistance training, you'll have nothing left in the tank. So I'm placing both running and jump rope in the C tier. Sure, if you're a boxer and you do jump rope for 10 years, you'll have decent calves. If you run for 10 years, you'll have decent calves. But do you have 10 years? You've been training for what, what, how many years in the gym? Three, four, you still have shit for calves. You don't have 10 years, okay? We have to have you do exercises that will be effective fast. And these exercises are usually the ones that you can load. So these ones go into the garbage. Biking is a bit different because if you set up your bike properly, which is very important, you can recruit a lot more calves and it's also very low impact. So I'm going to put biking in the B tier because in the grand family of cardio exercises that people think is going to blow up their calves, this one might actually work. It's still not super time efficient at all. And if you don't pay attention and your settings are not proper, biking will only grow your glutes and it will only grow your quad. You have to make sure that your foot can actually push and your heel can come off the pedal when you are at the end of a cycle. That is extremely important. But what if I were to tell you that the best way to grow big calves is not to be physically active at all? What if I told you that actually... If you just let yourself go and become a fat fuck, you will grow bigger calves by default. I know, I know, it's something that you've heard a million times before, but I had to put it in that tier list. Being fat is actually a great way to grow bigger calves, and it goes into the A tier. And it's not just there for the joke. It's also there because it shows to us what works with calves. The reason why people who are heavy 
have bigger calves is because they have to carry that extra load everywhere they go. So every step they take, the calves are put under a lot of pressure. If you look at athletes that are heavyweight, like strongmen, for example, or sumo wrestlers, you will see that their calves are always massive. I insist, but like if you follow sumo, you'll notice that the majority of them have massive fucking calves. Now, it might not be as applicable to you because it's not really practical at all to become obese simply to be able to get bigger calves, but it is in that list that high because, again, it teaches us lesson, and the lesson it teaches us is more weight applied to the calves equals massive calves, which is why an S-tier exercise for that muscle would be something like a weighted stair master. You go on the stair master with a backpack with weight in it and you do it on your tippy toes. You don't allow the forehill to touch the floor. You're always on your toes. Your calves are going to scream in agony, but if you do it enough for long enough periods of time consistently throughout the week you're essentially replicating the fat experience you are replicating what it would mean to have all of that extra body weight put on that muscle in situations where it has to handle that load so for this reason i'm placing the weighted star masters in the s tier now this does not mean that this should become your only calf exercise not at all because in the same line of reasoning, the calves are an extremely resilient and resistant muscle. They can take a beating. So if you manage to pair your resistance training exercise and isolation for calves with the Star Masters, you are going to be able to feed continuous amounts of volume to that muscle, which will force it to grow. Many people complain that their calves don't grow. And when you look at the volume they do, they do six sets a week. Six sets a week in relation to what your calves do on a day-to-day -day basis is jack shit. There's almost no difference. So you have to have the ability to push much, much further. And sadly, for people who still believe in that myth, squats are not going to do that for you. I don't give a fuck how many people say that squats will grow big calves. It doesn't fucking work because if it worked, we would all have massive calves. Look at the amount of natural bodybuilders that have gigantic quads and no calves whatsoever. Why do you think that is? It's because we, because I'm included in this, spent years doing all of these quad variations, getting very strong at them, and we did jack shit for calves. And the result is big ass upper legs and tiny ass lower legs. So squats go into the D tier. And the same goes for squat jumps. Just like with plyometrics, the fact that you're exploding up with the weight doesn't make up for the fact that the load is not efficient, the range of motion is not efficient, and there is no tempo. So this goes into the C tier. In my opinion, if you want an explosive exercise where you'll end up on your tippy toes, one that makes a lot more sense if you're the type of person who likes lifting heavy and hates calves isolation for some reason, is the clean pull because it's much easier to do a pose at the top to contract the calves and then to stay in control of the weight as it gets lowered. You can play around with some type of elevation for your foot. You can also get a decent yoke workout from it. So all in all, that is the type of exercise that I would say is actually fairly decent. I'm placing it in the B tier. But that's still an explosive exercise. And as we've seen, it doesn't seem to align with what the calves require to grow. So instead, what if we could get an heavy weight exercise where the tension on the calf is constant? Well, this exercise exists. It is the farmer walk. But instead of doing it properly with your heel full flush on the floor, you're going to do it on your tippy toes. As surprising as it might sound, this exercise actually has a name. It's called the toe touch farmer's walk. So you'll select a load that you can do for large amounts of time, maybe four to five minutes, and you'll simply go on a walk with them with straps. To me, that is an A-tier exercise for the calves. But you have to pay attention to the fact that it's still a farmer's walk, and so it's going to be very taxing on the entirety of the body. Something that is not taxing at all for anything but the calves is the next entry on the list, and that is the calf press. So it's doing a form of calf exercise, but on a leg press. And even though the range of motion is not the best, the amount of tension during the active range of motion of the movement is excellent. So to me, this is an exercise that must make it in the S tier. 
it's very, very easy to superset calf presses. It's very, very easy to include them several times throughout the week, which as we've seen with calves is key because you need to have the ability to feed a lot of volume for that muscle group without having other muscle groups interfere, which is sort of the tragedy of the calves when you think about it, because the reason why so many people struggle to grow them is because calves work in isolation. Right? They don't like to associate with other muscle groups. They do their own thing. If you could have compound movements that actually grew the entirety of the posterior chain, for example, and the calves, it would be much, much easier to actually get it done. But alas, it is not the case. And the same goes for a function of the calf that almost no one trains, and that is the tibialis raise. It's something that has become much more popular nowadays because of uh, like knees over toes guy. It's an exercise that is pushed a lot on people who want to rehab shin splints and it does a tremendous job at that, but it also is technically a calf exercise. The only difference being that instead of training the back of the calf, it trains the front. So it trains the front of the leg. Yes, you have muscles there. They're not very big, but if you develop them, they look actually pretty cool. So I'm going to place it in the C tier because this is not the exercise that will build massive bulbous calves but it's still something and as a rehab exercise, again, it does a good job. But if we're talking about secret calf exercises that are super underrated and no one does, I think the next one on the list takes the crown. That is the calf launcher, where you put yourself in a position that looks like a Nordic hamstring curl, but that isolate a certain function of the calf in priority. And the first time I saw that exercise, I thought to myself, oh, there's no way in fucking hell that this actually trains the calf. Then I trained it, and the tension that I felt on the muscle was unlike anything I've ever felt before. So if you're looking for an exercise to reignite your sensation when it comes to calf training, I think you should give that one a try. I'm going to place it in the B tier because it's awkward to load, and it's also not the type of like extreme stretch we're looking for, but just like with the calf press, it might just be the type of stretch that will make the difference when it comes to actually growing the muscle. One downside of it being that it's very boring. And I'll be honest with you, all of the exercises that I placed in very high tiers here are boring because I don't know a single person that gets hyped up to do a standing calf raise set. Like you have to do it if you want bigger calves, but it's not the type of superhero shit that gets the blood boiling. So I think it's a good idea to find a healthy balance between dynamic exercises like the farmer walks, for example, that will be exciting because they're very tough and the ones that you know you have to do that you can focus on the stretch and the sensation like those calf raises. And if you want to add another exercise onto that list of exciting movements, the sled push is a good one. When you do a proper sled push, your heel comes fully off of the floor and you are going to actually use your tippy toes to press against the floor to make distance. This is the reason why strong men tend to have massive calves. Not only do they carry heavy stuff all the time, they also tend to be very heavy individuals themselves. But when they do all of these car pulls or these truck pulls, you'll notice that their technique has them almost parallel with the floor and their calves are therefore put under tremendous pressure. But because you're very unlikely to just run into a car you can push in the wild, you can just replace this stimulus by a sled that you can load very, very heavy. You can do it for time, for distance. You can do it for very intense, short bursts of energy, all of which is going to make for a tremendous opportunity to train your calves in a very, very fun way. But you know who has even bigger calves in relation to their body weight than strongman? Ballerinas. Ballerina's calves are out of this wood. They tend to be bigger than their upper legs for the simple reason that they train the function of the calf in priority because they're always on their tippy toes. Now, I'm not telling you to cancel your gym membership and become a ballerina. What I'm saying, however, is that we can also learn a lesson from that. And that is that if you just do most things on your tippy toes and you find ways to conserve your balance, your calves are going to grow. So a stupid but effective way to train your calves would simply be to catwalk everywhere you go. You see how cat's legs work? Well, it looks like they're tiptoeing everywhere while well, you just do the same thing. Walk on your tippy toes and soon enough, your calves will grow. You will look absolutely ridiculous and it won't be efficient at all for long distance. But as you've seen, the amount of exercises you can use to directly isolate the calves in the gym 
is fairly limited because that's the end of the tier list. That's pretty much that. And some people might see this as the reason why people cannot grow big calves because we don't have access to enough exercises. But to me, that's not true. Even if there was only five decent calf exercises, you should still be able to grow that muscle. The reason why most people cannot manage, me included, is because we don't stick to it enough. We know isolating your calves fucking works, just like any other muscle, but we are simply not able to give enough tension and enough volume to the calves to give them a reason to grow. And this is what I'm going to conclude this tier list on, because I think that this is the key piece of advice that is going to tie everything together. Both when it comes to cardio and calves, the best exercise is the one you're going to stick to. So you have to pick things that you're going to enjoy. Look at the amount of people who cannot stick to cardio to save their life. Look at the amount of people who would apparently rather shoot themselves in the face than train their calves for longer than a month at a time. The issue in both cases is that the choice that they made in terms of exercise selection was not the right one. So they were never excited to do it and so they never did it. So my advice is use these tier lists as a, an inventory of sort and pick options from the S and A tier. Choose the one that you know you're going to enjoy, that you're going to have fun doing and do it several times a week. And I guarantee you that if you can stick to this level of consistency for a solid year, the results you will get at the end will absolutely shock you, which is something that you already know because you've done that for other muscle groups. You've managed to get big on other muscle groups. You've managed to improve in other areas. So why would cardio or calves be any different? It makes no sense whatsoever. And you know it, but I hope that this video was a good reminder of it because this episode marks the end of the last exercises tier list. But fear not, I'm not done with this format yet. I have a ton of other ideas for tier lists related to the domain of bodybuilding. So if you enjoy this series, consider supporting the channel on Coffee. It's the first link in the description. You can either do a one-time donation or you can subscribe for a monthly pledge. It might not seem like much, but just $3 a month already makes a big difference because it's thanks to these pledges that I'm able to treat this channel as my second job and spend all this energy and time making these videos for you guys. And I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.